So now we're going to leave the tutorial dungeon behind and leap into one of our outdoor areas, a zone called Dalentarth. Welcome to Dalentarth. So Dalentarth is the first major zone you'll get to in the game of five massive outdoor zones that are all open for exploration. There's no load screens in between them, anything like that. Um, you can just go wherever you want. Um, Dalentarth, there's a few things to point out here. First, it's very, very pretty. And there's a reason for this. It's not just that we like to make pretty things, although there's that too, but also some good design reasons. One of those is that, again, it's the first zone you come to after the tutorial. So we want to make the world feel warm and welcoming and, and magical. As you notice, these like little blue sprites flitting about us as we walk through the world, um, part of the whole age of, age of Arcana bit. And uh, you know, making it feel like a place you want to explore. And although dangers do abound in Dalentarth, it is comparably safer than the rest of the world and gives you kind of a nice intro into the game. Another thing about it, uh, which is pretty cool, is sort of uh, where RA is coming in. RA has sold us, told us many times, it's an RPG. So you know, as a player, sooner or later, somebody's going to walk up to you and they're going to ask you to save the world. And when that happens, you have to actually want to save the world. And uh, you know, what he has said over and over is, we need to make Emmeler a world worth defending. And Dalatarth is an example of how we do that, making this the sort of place that you, you actually want to save from on. Now, another thing you'll notice here, we are still a warrior-esque character, but we're decked out very differently than we were before. We have much fancier armor. This is cool. This is actually consecrated to Theoden, the war god. Very cool. Um, and an Azurite longsword on our back. In addition to that sword, we also have a very large hammer. Like so. Now, in the tutorial earlier, you saw the most basic form of the combat, which is just one weapon. That's as we're kind of easing you into the game, teaching you how it works. For the majority of the game, though, you actually have two weapons. You can slot whatever you want into those two weapon slots, and you can seamlessly switch between them, even mid-attack chain, which you can see Joe doing here and in the combat to come. There's no button to switch off. There's no, well, let me go to my right hand and not use my right hand weapon. No. On the Xbox controller, it's X for your primary weapon, Y for your secondary. Happens right now. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Also, what you're going to see in the fights ahead are some special combo attacks. And we have to be careful when we use the word combo, because it means something a little different in Reckoning than it does in, say, uh, an action game. We never, ever, ever force you to memorize button combos. You will not do XXYYD in Reckoning. <laughs> One thing that we've, we've had to drill home time and time again is that we're, we're ultimately not an action game. We are a hardcore RPG that has action combat. And it's a very different thing, and the combo is an example of how it's different. Everything that you see, the special attacks that Joe's going to do throughout the course of the uh, demo, including the ones you've already seen, they're contextual. I attack after I roll. I attack after I block. I attack after I carry. I attack simply by holding the button down. They're all really easy to discover, really easy to perform. You don't really need to memorize anything. And we'll see more of those throughout the course of the demo. Now, as we move forward, we're going to see uh, an example of the warrior in action, along with some of the warrior's magic abilities. Because in the Age of Arcana, even a warrior has access to magic. sadistic bastard. <laughs> you may have noticed uh, a moment in that combat um, where Joe flew into the air and a weapon magically coalesced in the air and then he crushed a boggart into tiny little pieces. Subtle, but it was there. <laughs> uh, that's something called a fate shift kill, which feeds into a different reward mechanism, a whole different system that unfortunately the marketing folks won't let us talk about yet, but you will hear more about that down the road. For future reference, it's a fate shift kill. Yeah. Now, as we move down the hill a little bit here toward Loch Dyden and the village of Dyden Hill, we'll talk a little bit about the world. As I mentioned, this is Dalatarf, one of those five major outdoor zones, each of which is ridiculously huge, and uh, each of which has a totally different art style, look, feel, and, and biome for that matter, ranging from uh, arid deserts to, to dank swamps. 
and of course the, the enchanted forest that is Zalatar. Um, like any good open world game, we do a few kind of world simulation-y things to, to make the world feel alive, living and breathing, which is something Ken Rolston really pushes hard. Um, an example of that is having a day-night cycle, which we'll show off here now. Now, the day-night cycle isn't just aesthetic. We also have NPC scheduling. So NPCs have their whole cycle of what they do over the course of the day, cleaning up the bar in the tavern, dancing at night, you know, maybe in the streets, it varies. But uh, they all have their things they do when they're not busy handing you quests. Uh, so that changes over the course of time of day. We also have a few systemic outputs, like we have uh, some areas of the game where certain monsters will only spawn at night. We have a weapon which by day is a flaming weapon and at night does ice. So things like that, it's, it's a lot, pretty cool. So now here as we walk into this village, you, you know what you'd expect from a village or a city in an RPG, and, and we have those things. It's a place you can go to rest, relax, recuperate, to buy new gear, to sell your old gear, with one button press, yeah, um, it's true. Um, you know, to, to buy new gear, sell your gear, to do crafting, to visit various service providers. And although this demo, as you, you've seen and will continue to see, is mostly focused on combat, we do want to show you at least a little bit of one of those systems now. This is one of our three crafting systems, it's called Sagecraft alongside alchemy and blacksmithing, which is the other two. Uh, Sagecraft lets you do a few different things. One of those things is socketing magical gems into your weapons and armor. It also lets you create your own gems from scratch using these crystal and shards you find throughout the world. Now, Joe conveniently has a gem of combustion in his inventory, so he's going to socket that into his longsword. And voila, now we have a flaming longsword. Now you can see that immediately the particle effects for that are automatically updated in addition to the actual damage that it's doing, and all the special attacks also change. And yes, this will set enemies on fire. And fun fact, the Bogarts you were fighting earlier, they're made of wood. If you set them on fire, they panic and run scream. It's great. <laughs> so move forward here. This is a good time to talk about Ken Rolston's influence on the game. We have this nice cobblestone path leading off ahead of us, kind of off into the wilderness. And uh, if we follow that, generally speaking, it's going to lead you to the next big moment that the designers want you to see. And we're designers, so yes, we, we do want you to see it. But you don't have to go that way. It is an open world game. There are countless paths and even places there aren't paths where you can go off the rails and find something cool. Uh, Ken often says that players want to wander into the weeds. And so we let you do that, and in fact, we encourage it. When you wander off, like on this dirt deer path that we're doing through this giant hollow log, um, you'll often find some sort of reward. You'll find a cool vista you can see that wouldn't have been obvious from the main road. You'll find a hidden treasure cache. You'll find a rare reagent you can harvest for alchemy. In this particular case, wandering off the beaten path is going to lead us to a monster type we haven't seen before. A couple of them, actually. One of them, you'll see up ahead, is a snake-like wild fey creature called the Banshane. Really nasty. She can vomit up these fleshy pods that hit the ground, and after a second, they'll spawn out mergens, which are sort of her drones. Now, because of the way this fight works, it's really sort of interesting to demonstrate here. A lot of our enemies in Reckoning work together in some sort of uh, cooperative way. For instance, the Bogarts you saw earlier, you may have noticed, although Joe killed them awfully fast, maybe not, hopefully you noticed that they will actually surround you in the middle of a fight, try to flank you, so one of them will keep you busy while another one rolls in and whacks you in the back. These guys work together in different ways. They actually have a, a formal group attack they can do where the Banshane will charge up lightning, the Mergans all hold their tridents up in the air, and you'll see this just in a moment, and lightning arcs between them, and then kaboom, she throws a, a high damage blast at you, or, or technically they do. Um, because of this, depending on your character build, your gear loadout, there's several different tactical ways you can approach that combat. For instance, if you're a pure melee warrior, like Joe is here, you can tank a lot of damage. So you might just want to, you know, just wade in there with your big kite shield, deal with the Merg and ignore them, and just focus on the Banshee until she's down. They can't do that group attack anymore. Or, let's say you're a mage who focuses on AoE attacks, you might want to stay back from the Merg and kind of dance around, and you'll see some of that mage combat later, and use their AoEs to keep them interrupted so they can't get off the lightning attack. We'll see an example of the warrior approach here now.
ahead, you're going to see these, these uh, standing stones, and as we get closer, you'll see they have uh, very specific engravings. And that's worth bringing up because this is a place that RA plays into the world. As I've said at least a couple of times, we have a 10,000 year history that everything's wrapped into. And these are a specific example of that. We have a rule. Nothing can exist in the game that doesn't have a purpose, a story, and a reason for being there. We actually joke around the office a lot when we come up with some new concept. Uh, a wizard did it. That's, that's how it works. We joke about it because RA will not let that fly. No, no, no. Everything in the game has a story, has a purpose, has a place in that grand scheme of things. For instance, the ruins we're seeing here uh, up ahead, these ones with the carvings, uh, were built by the Durek people in, in an earlier time period. Um, and they have their own culture and history and reason for being here. As we move forward, we're going to see a dungeon here in a moment built by an even earlier ancient people called the Arathi, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, can't say too much about them at this point, but I'll at least mention them a little bit. Um, and this helps make the world feel real, feel believable, because it isn't, it isn't random. It's like if you watch the Lord of the Rings movies, they did a great job of carving dwarven runes into the walls in places you can barely even see them, you know, but the actors could see them, and it made it feel to them more believable. And as a result, they acted better, and they really got into the parts. We're trying to do that for you, the player, as you act your way, role-playing, through the world of Amelie. So as you step forward here toward the dungeon, you're going to see some kobolds outside of it. This dungeon's in a rafty ruin called Earl Tusk. And the kobolds outside, aside from giving Joe something to fight, are a little bit of visual signposting. They let us know the kinds of enemies, at least some of the kinds of enemies, we're going to find inside that dungeon. Which is important, because some enemies are nastier than others, and as a player, you want to know what you can expect inside. Check it out. 